Now we will have the last panel session of the day on transforming with intelligence, how a tipping point is emerging with data for sustainability. This session is hosted by Francis Poon, the Market Development Lead in Strategic Partnerships of Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. This session is also supported by the Finnish Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Thank you for your support. Without further ado, please welcome Francis and the speakers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Francis from the uh, Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. It's a pleasure to have the last uh, session of the thing. I think you know it's always about saving the best for last, and nothing is better than talking about data, right? We heard one data scientist here, but I don't know. Do we have any other data gurus or data interested people? Anyways, I think Chris's uh, initial planning was to really, um, you know, from such a dry. Uh, 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 interesting topic to make it make make the home stretch a, a tough one. So we do have a few experts here to share, um, you know, from an innovation perspective and a sustainability perspective, how we look at um, uh, the use of data in various cycles of the innovation chain. Right at the Hong Kong Science Park, we like to think about um, innovation in you know three main steps. You have the creation process of where uh, Dr. Intella Benz would come and talk to you about you know, kind of AI models that are coming in place from a climate perspective uh, with financial impact. Uh, then you talk about the development perspective, the lab perspective, and that's where uh, we have uh, Pub some CLP to share his insights. And then the most important and equally important is the adoption phase, right? How it actually hits the market uh, with, uh, with the, all this uh, intelligence. And that's where Henry comes into play. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, maybe go through the uh, a little bit of introduction, uh, if you will, Pubs, and then we'll go across the side. Sure. Thanks, Francis. Just um, as a matter of introduction for any of our overseas audience, um, so CLP, uh, we are a power utility that's headquartered in Hong Kong, but we've also got presence in China, India, as well as Australia. Uh, founded in 1901, so we're celebrating our 120-year anniversary very, very soon. Um, so there's a lot of history there, and throughout that history, we've been putting together a large generation portfolio. But more recently, we've also added from just supplying of energy to customers, also managing that energy, and, and that's where um, we kick in within innovation. So we help our customers on building energy management as one of our focus areas, but then we've got other services as well, so uh, power purchasing agreements, um, supporting on things like data centers and microgrids and, and so forth. Uh, so it's a very, very um, interesting area, but one of the things that we focused on is having sustainability as one of our guiding principles of providing our services to our customers. Thanks. That's, um, um, my name is written there, is Antela Benz. Um, I'm a CEO and co-founder of Intensel. So what does Intensel do? Uh, Intensel is using deep technology for measuring risk, specifically financial risk related to climate change. So how did you come up to this? Well, my background is financial, uh, I come from financial industry. I'm also a professor at UST Business School. The CTO is a climate scientist. And given our long expertise in the market, especially my 17 years in Hong Kong in ESG, the relevance of climate risk, climate, physical climate risk, is so important in terms of size and impact that we need to start addressing climate risk in real data not just talking about it, but measuring and taking action. So that's what we do at Intensel. We measure climate risk, we turn it in dollar value, and we give these numbers to companies and help them to address the problem. Thank Henry, you. Over to uh, you. Yep. I'm Henry Chung from Connie uh, Corporation. Uh, in fact, we are a Finnish company from Scandinavia. Uh, a lot of people think we are Japanese, but we are not. <laughs> uh, uh, Actually, two days ago, we celebrated our 110th anniversary. So we've been around for too, too long. Uh, but having said that, uh, because of, uh, we are a Scandinavian company, innovation and creativity is in our blood. So we are very much into uh, looking forward into the future. Uh, what lifts and escalator, because we manufacture them, uh, can bring to people. Now, we don't talk about we manufacture lifts and escalator. 
we talk about uh, people flow, how we bring people from one point to another. Uh, in fact, if you look outside in this building, this is one of our latest uh, uh, sites. Uh, they have the latest technology here built in in this building, uh, facial recognition, although they, we are not allowed to talk about it too much, uh, and, uh, and uh, data collection and remote control and so on. I'll talk about that in a, in a, a more in later. Sure, thanks, Henry. Um, I think we're going to set the scene a little bit with uh, some of the heavier uh, data s foundations that we like to kick into. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, get into a couple of slides here um, where Dr. Benz can talk about some of the studies that she's done in respect to uh, the Hong Kong situation in the Congress. So over to you, Intel. Thank you, Francis. So, um before starting there, I would like to set the scene with the set in ESG versus climate. Uh, many times when I talk, people think that climate risk is part of ESG. You do ESG, you in already include that uh, in your assessment. Actually, it's not. Physical climate risk is much bigger than ESG story. ESG also is its company to the environment. So we're talking about environmental footprint the company is on, on the planet, on society. Climate risk, physical climate risk, is what the planet is doing to the company. It's the other way around. So one is endogenous, the other is exogenous risk. Climate risk has much bigger repercussion in terms of um, not just uh, cash flow, financial dollar loss, but also so social risk, right? So that's why we need to address physical climate risk. Um, so that's set in the scene on climate risk versus ESG. It's much bigger and much more relevant and much more urgent than ESG. Number two, Asia has 50% more climate risk than, um, than Europe and twice as more climate risk than US. On top of that, you have seen all the typhoon season hit in Vietnam, flooding in China, Yangtze River, and all this stuff. On top of that, you have a very high urbanization going on in, in Asia. And where do people go? They go in the coastal cities. Coastal cities are the ones which will be mostly affected by climate change. So you have a double warming in, in Asia. So you have high climate risk and high dollar loss because that's where population is concentrated. That's where you have the economic activity. So that's why it's very relevant for Asia to start, Asian-based company, Asian assets, to start measuring their exposure to climate risk. Now, that leads you to the other dimension, which is, how do you do that? ESG is relatively easy. I, <laughs> the presenter before was saying, well, they don't know how to do it. Everybody talks about it. But speak, frankly speaking, relative to climate risk, is a different level of play. Because ESG is company data. You can measure, you can report. Climate risk, we're talking about rainfall, temperature, sea level rise, um, you name it. it so, the amount of data, the complexity of climate, the physics behind is at a different level. That's why you need big AI. You need big data, you need AI, you need supercomputing powers to measure this risk so the companies can start taking action on that. Right? So you need to provide the solutions to companies for companies to act. You can't just ask the companies disclose on climate risk without helping them to disclose their exposure to climate risk. Right? And for that, you need, you need deep expertise. So what we do is we combine basically three fields. One is climate science. The second one is financial modeling, where I come from. Um, and the third one is the technology. Without the three, you can't, it's very difficult to do it. You can do it, but it's very difficult to do it robustly and in a manner which makes sense for companies to act upon. So we get all this data from satellites, from research, from uh, NGOs from, you name it, from academic publications, et cetera, et cetera, so it's terabytes of data. We elaborate the data, then we combine the data. So if you combine rain, rainfall and winds, it gives you typhoon. Rainfall and terrain slope gives you landslide. So we elaborate the data, we predict the data, we downscale the data, we generate data, you name it. There's a lot of process going on, which you can't do not ask companies to do that. It's beyond their capacities. And we then map this exposure on a f building footprint, on an asset level footprint, on the asset level. Why do we do that? Well, imagine that you have a company which is at the top of the hill and a company which is at the bottom of the hill. It's only 10 meters difference, 
But that 10 meters make a lot of difference in terms of dollar loss to floods. If there's a flood in event or rainfall flood, the one on the top or 10 meter high, sorry, 10 meter higher is not going to be affected. So you need to go very precise. That's why climate risk does not forgive you in terms of error. We're talking about million dollar losses. So you need to be precise in this in science piece uh, methodology. So this is just Hong Kong. We have done that for all Hong Kong. Each building, you click, you can see how much flood risk you have, how much storm surge, so coastal flooding, rainfall flooding, river flooding, um, extreme uh, winds, extreme temperatures, you, na you name it, whatever you want on that location, landslide risk, etc. So that's the first part. And then you do stress as scenarios. You see how bad it's going to get by 2030, 2050. If you don't believe the data right now, at least you can see the change from now to the future. So then that change, that plus 5 million, plus 10 million, should make you aware that you should act on it. So the change, the absolute number maybe is not relevant, but the change, how fast it's happening and by when, is what is relevant. So that's on the climate. Um, now, can you give this to the CEO or CFO? Obviously not. What can you do with the typhoon predictions, right? It's a bit difficult. You need to integrate them in your business, on your business decisions. So what do you do? Next step is you take the vulnerability approach. You take the, in a nutshell, insurance approach. Given that level of flooding, that's how much loss you have on your property, but also on the economic level because you have business interruption, right? So you assess this uh, value at risk, we call it climate value at risk. And there you use other big data. You use population, urbanization, vegetation, terrain model, satellite nightlight data, etc. So it's another layer of data which you need. And then you use all this financial modeling to come up with a dollar loss, right? So which is, this is a dollar loss per building in Hong Kong across different variables. And you put this, all this together, the client gets the climate risk and the dollar loss, different stress scenarios, you name it, RCP 8.5 for species concentration of CO2, etc. So you need big data to make it easy for client to understand how much loss he's going to have by 2030, 2050, or should the temperature go by 2 degree, 1 degree, 0.5 by 2100. So you need to give the analytics and make it easy for them to act upon. And who are our clients? Uh, before I pass the micro, it's, it's across sectors. All the businesses have exposure to climate risk. Some have property damage, real estate. Some have operational damage, and some have both, right? So all get affected, but to a certain extent, to a certain different dimension, different levels. So that is up to the company to decide how to act. But first, you make it available to them how to act. Great. Thank you very much. That was a lot okay. of a, a, a mental load, I think, for <laughs> to explain that. But I think that really goes to show you know, the capabilities that you're bringing um, from an AI, AI level, which is, you know, th that predictability that I think you, you're, you said you were modeling out into, you know, 20, 30, 40 years out, that type of time frame. And uh, really, you know, when you look at the data uh, or the conclusions, you know, th th this, uh, the, the situation we're facing, it's, it's quite, uh, you know, um, uh, severe, you could say, uh, in, in magnitude. So thanks for that. Um, Can I just jump yeah. in? Um, I, I think in terms of to your point, about tangible examples. We have that real example. We have hundreds of substations that are scattered around Hong Kong. And I remember four or five years ago, we were looking at this exact same problem. We were trying to predict what the flood level is going to be and the flood risks are going to be for our substations. Electricity and water doesn't mix well. So our only source was Hong Kong Observatory, which is, is for a slightly different purpose. And when we got that data, we didn't get to a level of granularity down to the building level. So it's, it's a real value for us from an operational perspective, but I think, as you said, from 20, 30 years out, it's, it's also really helpful for us because our investments in our infrastructure, they are 30, 40, 50 years out. So this kind of level of value-added data is really, really important, certainly for infrastructure-heavy organizations like ours. Perfect. And since both of you are at the Science Park, you can walk across the street and connect with each other relatively easy. Um, anyways, so let's, let's move on to you, Pubs. Um, you know, you're, you're part of a large organization. You're part of a very, you know, almost a, a think tank or a lab, like a development arm, uh, innovation development arm of CLP. Uh, maybe share with us some of that, you know, uh, developments you're doing from a data perspective for, um, you know, the, 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 the topic at hand. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe I can talk about um, two examples. So we supply electricity. So from a um, supply standpoint, there's been an interesting challenge for quite some time in that we have our power generation infrastructure that supplies electricity for normal days as well as peak days. So the peak days, they only happen a few days throughout the year, but you still need the larger infrastructure setting there. And that's a challenge because having a large power plant that's there just for those days is quite expensive, but then there's also a sustainability consideration. Should you be using that fuel just for those cases? So one of the things that we've been rolling out is uh, smart meters over the last year, and we've got a program to do that for, for the next few years for all of our customers to get smart meters. Why that's relevant is that with a smart meter, every resident can get the understanding of their energy from every 30 minutes. So you can understand exactly when you, where your peaks are and your usage throughout the day. Why that's really important is that suppose that you're told that between 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock, there is going to be peak usage for all of the supply area. As a utility, we can give you some incentives to reduce that load. So you're incentivized to reduce that energy, and that means that we don't have to do that excess generation. So that's the case of using data, using prediction, and then incentives to change that behavior so that customers can change their usage. That's a really relevant use case, and we've had um, a lot of success around the world, and in Hong Kong, we're just starting out with this. Um, in fact, in one of our subsidiaries in Australia, there was a three-year pilot that was running, and there was lots of executions of this in real-life cases, and there were thousands of customers that signed on to this, and they were very, very comfortable to reduce their air conditioner by a few degrees and be slightly less comfortable so that they can first get the incentives, but then also contribute to the grid as well. Now, in Australia, energy is quite different. Everyone talks about it because there are blackouts and there are high prices. In a, in a, in a backyard barbecue, people are actually talking about energy prices. In Hong Kong, we're in a slightly different situation. People are not so willing to adjust that comfort level. A few days ago when I was in an Uber, um, I was telling exactly about this story to the Uber driver, and one of the things he said, my mother would never, ever let you touch the air conditioner. <laughs> Our comfort is really important. So there's a, there's a case of data helps in order for us to provide that solution, but then from a customer side as well, there is a change of behavior that's required too. That's just from a supply perspective. And then from a customer perspective as well, um, one of the things that we do is provide a lot of energy management solutions. So things like optimizing the chiller, providing health to buildings so that facility managers know exactly where the wastage is so they can go and address those in real time so that they can adjust any wastage cases within a building. And there's a whole range of such solutions that we offer as well, all driven by data, but all there where there needs to be a behavior change. Great. Thanks, Bob. That was excellent. And uh, Henry, over to you. Maybe share some of your examples, please. Sure. Um, on, on the usage of data, which I echo Pop's uh, experience, is that, uh, what, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a system that uses uh, big data, AI, to collect information from all our equipment, this and escalators in operation, and uh, send the failure statistics and data to our technician, to our frontline, to our engineers. Uh, that helped by uh, predicting what is going to fail, uh, and the technician can bring the right spare part with them to the site. Well, we have a pledge to all, all our uh, customers, the uh, management and the owners, that we have, we'll be on site within 30 minutes of any uh, incident. Uh, so, okay, now we send a technician, let's say from a depot, within 30 minutes. Uh, so he arrives to site, and find, find out, oh, okay, uh, this uh, motor drive failed. So either he calls another guy to bring a spare part in, which is another half an hour, or he has to go back to the depot, half an hour, come back, another half an hour, provided the spare part is available in the right place. So it's already one and a half hour. But if we have big data, uh, then he, he can bring the, uh, the right spare part with him first time that's save one hour already. 
And uh, using Antella's example is that uh, when, uh, well, in Hong Kong, there used to be a lot of floods. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are living in Hang Fa Chun, uh, you, you are very aware of this uh, flooding into the building. Now, once the water is in the building, that means the, the lift well will be flooded. And that means you can operate the lift. And take, that takes ages to uh, recover. Now, if we have big data, we know that, okay, this is now a very high uh, uh, probability of flooding area. Then we bring the appropriate, uh, we have the, uh, the sandbags and the, and the uh, planks and everything to block the water f uh, flowing in before it happens. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, you know, uh, that's safe, not just the equipment life, because uh, after flooding, you, we have to uh, replace a lot of parts especially uh, salt water in the uh, seaside area, uh, and also helps by the, the, to the uh, owner and the uh, resident that they can reuse the, uh, the equipment faster. So there's a lot of uh, benefits, sustainability as well. We don't need to replace uh, and waste uh, parts. So that, that's example number one. Example, maybe I'll use another one, which is uh, very recent. It's like COVID-19. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, complaining about the uh, lifts being the high risk area. Even, even the uh, SAL government uh, claim that the, uh, you don't, you are avoiding the uh, lift inside the lift uh, as much as possible. But unfortunately, our technicians, they have to be there every day in different locations even. So how do we uh, protect them and uh, bring about, uh, you know, bring it the right safety level and a security level to all our staff. So we have to use our uh, mobile devices, we have to use our communication devices just to uh, get all the data from the government uh, and from various sources as well, and dispatch that information to all our staff uh, if there is a problem problematic area, building, that has uh, uh, certain uh, infected uh, uh, people uh, found, then they should avoid going there. So, you know, all these are helping uh, to protect our staff in addition to uh, using data, in addition to uh, improve our uh, uh, operation. You know, they, they don't need to waste their time going to a, a site where they cannot do anything and to, 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 uh, they need to reschedule their, their uh, activities for the day. So that's another example that uh, is very useful in using data in bringing better uh, utilization of uh, the equipment and the people, people's time in particular. Great, no, that's a, I think you're talking about um, the, the, when I hear you give those examples, um, I'm hearing a lot of um, grassroots self-discovery or, or you know, kind of innovation on the ground level through maybe through your workforce themselves. Um, from a management perspective, you know, from a leadership perspective, how did you um, take on that, uh, you know, th empower that uh, culture to, for them to evolve these innovations, especially with data. I mean, you know, we have mobile phones up, but, but how do you get the organization to rally around certain solutions? Uh, for a big corporation, multinational corporation is not easy. <laughs> but, uh, well, actually, I, I used to work for another corporation where, you know, uh, uh, if there is a local uh, idea, innovation, we have to go through the headquarters to the uh, central R&D team, and then they vetted the proposal. And then, okay, approved, then you have to go back to get your budget, and then, ah, okay, this is a good idea, but it's better to be implemented in Germany, for example. Okay, two years later, the solution came. But it, well, in our company, because we are Finnish, so uh, we encourage everyone from ground level all the way up to CEO uh, to be innovative. So we encourage even, even the solution we have here in Hong Kong, uh, sort of invented by our young engineer, just came out of school a year ago. And they have very good idea because they are, you know, uh, mobile phone freaks. They, they, they have a mobile phone, they cannot leave without home, uh, leave home without it type. So they have very good idea of how to implement a, a touchless solution for the uh, buttons. In about a week, implemented in four weeks, uh, deployed in six weeks. It's cannot be imagined. You know, the older generation, the old dogs, so to speak, say, ah, no, no, it cannot be done. It will take ages. And six weeks later, it, on the site <laughs> already. 
Yeah. So this is the idea. This is the way. Uh, and I encourage that everyone, okay, open-minded, be, uh, be a bit more uh, risk, take risk, risk uh, not risk averse, but uh, taking uh, the right level of risk so that you can have uh, a step forward. Right, absolutely. And because this stuff, this stuff is tough, right? It's yes. you're moving yeah. a lot of people, changing you know, practices, changing routine schedules, et cetera. So that, that's definitely uh, great to see that type of culture to, to embrace that. Um, I do want to uh, bring it back to Intella. And uh, your example, I'm still wrapping my head around it, the enormity of the data set and the proposition that you're proposing, uh, the, external, the externalness or externality of it into an application such as CLP. How do, you, how, do you, how do you navigate that? Or how, you know, we got different representatives of different organizations here. They're looking at the wildness of it, but yet, you know, how can you take those bite-sized chunks or a way to adopt into some type of, uh, you know, adoption curve uh, to, to get on the path? Very good point. Um, and it's difficult to answer now. But so far, I've, we came up with a solution to that. So first of all, is climate risk is a new risk is a new risk in town, so, but it's a trend, and you want to capture the trend. Regulators are pushing for it, so whether the companies like it or not, whether or not we'll do it the old way, there's no more old way, they have to do it, which means that the speed of adoption for our solution is there, right? So we have more demand than capacity, which is good. The problem is, because that's the old generation, they're not used to climate risk. So you have to make it easy for them to use it. Mm -hmm. And how do we make it easy? Well, we use all our, uh, so you need cross-disciplinary expertise. So you use a lot of tech, data, climate science, financial modeling, and give them just a couple of numbers they understand. So you have to make it easy. You also have to make it fast. They don't care how many terabytes of data you're working on. They don't want to wait one, one year and a half like other consulting companies will do it, so they want it now. So our solution is you click, you see it, that's it. They don't care how much work is behind. So you is a compromise. You work hard, make it look easy, and give it to them as an easy thing to adopt. Now, can they adopt it? No. I mean, they can, but they don't know how. So again, at the beginning, we come almost like a consultancy approach. We said, these are the data, and that's your climate risk for that location. What do you want to do with that? One use is you use it, and you disclose to your regulators, to TCFD, ESG, whatever is, is for your disclosure. The other is to engage with investors who are asking about this, and they have a lot of pressure from investors. But this is only on the surface, and for us, it's an easy hanging fruit. Right? We can give this overall climate risk to everyone. But then you have CLP, and you have a real estate owner who has property in Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Wuhan, Hong Kong, Exchange Square. So then they want to know how much climate risk I have exactly, because I'm constructing, I'm building, I'm making a new wind farm, or I'm making a new property. Right? But before I put money into that, I want to know how much risk I have. Or it's an existing property, I want to know how much flood risk I have so I can build flood walls. So this is not just disclosing to client, to client and to regulators. It's really protecting your bottom line, right? Minimizing your losses and, and your efficiency and operational loss, so minimizing. Or for, uh, for energy companies, it's in better predicting wind power generate. So wind, better prediction of wind leads to higher, uh, so you choose the right turbine to start with, depending on the wind. Then you choose the right location, the right direction, and the right maintenance during the year. So there is a lot of benefit, not just uh, on, a, on a minimizing the cost, but also increasing the generation, the, the energy coming from, um, from wind. Um, so, so basically, you can give them overall product, but then you can address the specific needs of the client. As I said, is a real estate. He only wants to care. He cares about typhoons and floods because these are the ma major destructive variables, climate, physical climate risk, which causes dollar loss, right? As well as extreme temperature. Because extreme temperature, it means you use more air con, you use more energy, you pay a higher bill, you have higher CO2, which goes an ESG report, which means you have a higher transition risk because you have to pay more carbon price in the future for that. So it's all linked. You need to know how much temperature will go in 10 years, so you can plan for cooling efficiency. You put solar panels on the roof, et cetera, et cetera. You, 
you change the gate of the building from northwest to south where the flood water does not come in. Um, you, you predict the number of typhoons and severity, so number and severity of typhoons for next 10, 50 years ahead in that location. And you decide not to buy that prop to property or just try to, to sell it. So these are real costs to the company. And that's visible. So once they see it, but again, you have to make it easy. He doesn't care about typhoon prediction. He just wants to know how many typhoons, what's the strength of typhoons. Right. You give it to him, and, and that's dollar loss to that. And then he will act upon it. So it's, it's um, again, it's, no matter how complicated it is, it has to be easy, it has to look easy, and it has to be adopted in the easier and, and kind of seemingly uh, compatible with existing frameworks they have in place. Otherwise, if it's a big disruption, it's, uh, it's like... Yep. Got it. No, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, got a question in from uh, the screen here, and I think this one may play out to pubs a bit, but let, let me read it out. Uh, what challenges might private companies face when understanding physical climate risk data? Utilities and property sector players might have the highest sense of risk perception, but how might other industries also be more proactive to use such data? Yeah. Um... Yes, for you. We go through a lot of scenario planning in from a micro level, so from day-to-day -day supply, from also on infrastructure level as well. Where is the future population growth going to be in our supply areas? So we can figure out where we can put together our infrastructure to support citizens. Uh, that level of uh, structure and planning, that's ingrained into our DNA. Um, and that's been there for decades and decades because it's just part of our business model. Um, we all have to think longer term, um, just as Intel was highlighting earlier, we were just forced to do so. Uh, one example I can highlight is, is that um, a lot of buildings in Hong Kong, there's 40,000 odd buildings, they were constructed at a time where sustainability was not really a core focus. So we've got a lot of inefficient buildings that are there. We're here, we're stuck with it, we're not going to rip apart and replace our buildings, so what can you do? So there's a lot of other options that we put together where we can retrofit smart solutions. So one of the things that we do uh, as well. So although there are mitigations there, the best thing to do is to plan ahead. Um, simple to say, but I, I think those kind of conversations, we need to make sure we're putting that lens from a, a climate risk right now as we look out. So don't just plan for the five, 10 years, look at 15 to 20 and hear about what the models are that you see because they are becoming more and more real. The design patterns that we have of yesterday, which we tend to copy when we do our plannings, you can no longer do that. We really need to use the data that's available in order for us to actually choose more carefully in where we spend our capital. Great, thanks. Henry, anything to add? Uh, the challenges well, you face? And well, the, well, I think uh, that there's a, um, we call, how do we move the, or maximize the efficiency of moving people around uh, by not, uh, uh, be too visible, so to speak. So there's a lot of simulation, as uh, Pap has said as well, that uh, we have to put it, even in, in uh, designing uh, which floor we, that the owner should uh, lease first, uh, and how to distribute the people in, in each floor would have to be uh, carefully planned. And the, uh, uh, we call elevator banks, how many would go from fl uh, ground floor to 10th, and how many would go from uh, 11 to uh, 20 or 30. So there's a lot of um, um, design into this, this uh, uh, how to maximize the people flow so that in the end, the usage of the uh, ele elevator will be uh, sort of evenly distributed, energy will be minimized in the usage, and also the, uh, the fear of people of not w uh, wasting the time waiting for a lift will be reduced. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an art, I would say. So we have the balance of few parameters and also that the couple with uh, where people coming in into the building from MTR or from the buses or from uh, the car park and so on. So there's a lot of uh, uh, input into there. So that we, we built such a model and help the owner in constructing uh, the ma maximize efficiency of, of their building usage. Yeah, no, I hear these examples and really you guys are taking really good uh, uh, actions into you know, making 
making data work for your efficiency operations and I'm pretty sure your, your bottom line as well. Um, any questions from the audience? While they maybe uh, raise a question, I may uh, uh, add to the point before. Utilities that might have more climate, are they, what the, the question was like whether they are aware of climate risk, especially the utilities. Um, yeah, um, understanding physical climate risk data. What challenges might private companies face yeah, when they understand physical climate risk data? But especially the utilities, right? It's, so, yeah, uh, they might have the highest sense of risk perception, but how other industries can also take on. So the higher risk perception, um, and, there's an interesting fact that when Schroeder did this survey in 2018, financial sector is the most aware of climate risk. And utilities came towards the end of the line, not CLP. CLP is very high uh, <laughs> because we're working on that. <laughs> but it's interesting. They have most exposure to climate risk because they use climate to generate power, whether it's a hydro, it's a coal, and they, they pollute, or they use gas or wind and solar like CLP does excessively. So they, they use it for gen revenue generation, but also they have loss because they're exposed to climate risk. So they have double exposure to that. Uh, but the interesting financial re sector is the most aware because they do project finance. They give loans. They have to disclose. They are asked from central bank, to, the first one in line to disclose on climate risk. You have all climate risks accumulated in their portfolio. Asset manager, insurance, banks. They have this risk in their portfolio sitting there. So they are the one actually more... Uh, most pressing us for solution on climate risk. Whereas utilities, somehow they have been exposed to this, so it's not new to them, but for the rest of the sector, it's a new risk, and they are more um, aware and kind of, uh, not panicking, but yep. in yep. urgent need for this. Kind Absolutely, of that makes a lot of sense when you throw the uh, you know, money at it, um, or the, the uh, um, uh, implications of finance into it. I think that gets a lot of... Uh, you know, serious consideration. So that's a, that's a good takeaway as well. Thank you. Um, our time is up, but since uh, we're the last panel, I'm gonna take a little more uh, time to really, you know, you heard a lot of maybe industrial um, examples here, and you can see there's use cases that's already working in this space with data, which is, again, when Chen came in, I thought, you know, it's, it's a pretty interesting, you know, kind of black and white type of uh, thing. But we did come up with some things you, can, you as an audience can take away as well. And um, we're <clears throat> I'm just gonna read them out. I think it's important to take this home with you. I, I was really inspired by the last uh, person who talk, talked about opening up the refrigerator and, and looking at your food uh, ecosystem in a whole new light. So I think same with data and uh, how it implies to you, not just at your workplace, but also in a personal level, but maybe you can start at a workplace. So one, uh, we have a few uh, actions uh, that we want to, uh, I'll just read them out to you. The first one is identify one energy saving initiative with the right sponsor in your organization. Okay. Next one, very easy. Start one conversation with a person in charge of data insights of your operations function. Okay, or contributing to that. It doesn't have to be the person inside data insights, so somebody who's re related to that. Um, third one, create a list at work showing power consumption of all electronics that they have come across at work and separate it into must have versus nice to have. Something we sh I think we could do responsibly very readily easily. And there's a the last one that um, Henry gave out the last minute and I think you know, this one is very worthwhile is personally record your daily routine in detail for a period of time, say one week, and you may identify a certain action you may reduce or eliminate. Hence save electricity usage, reduce waste and extend certain appliance life. For example, instead of watching TV in your own living room with the AC turned on, later switch to a bedroom, turn your AC another AC on, do most of your activities in a small place. Another example is to physically switch off your PC at work instead of turning to standby. All right. Okay, so I'll leave you with that. Please give me a very big thank you to our expert panelists here, and thank you for your time. And staying all the way to the end.